Episode 1, St. Barbara's Day and Early Chinese Developments. Welcome to Fire Mission Battery, a podcast history of artillery. I'm your host, John Moore. St. Barbara, patron saint of gunners. The original stories of St. Barbara are varied and probably of little consequence to our story. Consensus, though, has her in Heliopolis in Phoenicia, modern-day Baalbek in Lebanon's Bakar Valley, back in the 3rd century CE. The story goes like this. Barbara's wealthy pagan father was going away on business, so he built a tower to keep her away from the lads, Rapunzel-style. When he returned, she'd somehow converted to Christianity without human contact. Her father was not pleased and hauled her before the local Roman official, the provincial prefect. Death was the decision, and her father got to swing the sword through her neck. On his way home, and this is the bit that relates to gunners, Dad was struck down with a lightning bolt and reduced to ashes. Only the sword remained. Given the instability of early, and maybe not so early, gunpowder, and the tendency of early pieces to fail catastrophically while firing, the sudden lightning bolt in retribution for St Barbara's death became associated with gunners, and armourers, field engineers, miners, and, well, basically anyone who works with explosives. Curiously, she's also the patron saint of mathematicians, but we'll let that go for the moment. The 4th of December is St Barbara's Day, and gunners around the world market. Bizarrely, though, Barbara has been removed from the Catholic Church's Day of Saints because her origin story is a bit dodgy. I'll just leave that sentence there. And we can move on to early Chinese weapons development, from fire lance to field piece. The development of black powder, the original gunpowder, was documented in the Song Dynasty about 960 CE. It seems reasonable that the knowledge was around for some time before this date, but probably not more than decades rather than centuries, although I have found a reference arguing for a 2nd century BCE. So who's to know? Uh, If you do, drop me a line and uh, leave a comment over at the website, link in the show notes. Always happy to get new information. The recipe and process involves combining, for gunpowder, involves combining saltpetre, potassium nitrate, sulphur and charcoal. About 75% saltpetre makes it the major ingredient. Now when these three ingredients are combined as dry granules, the mixture becomes explosive. Once ignited, the powder produces heat up to about 2700 degrees C and gives off huge amounts of gas. One gram of the powder producing up to 360 cubic centimetres of the gas. And it is this rapid expansion of gas which propels any projectiles. Originally used as noisemakers to frighten troops and horses, think fireworks, eventually the idea of a projectile weapon evolved and one of the earliest was the fire lance. These devices date to the 10th century and the Jin Song Wars. Having a small range, they were, though, an improvement on an actual lance, reaching out to about 3 metres at a maximum, so not over the horizon in direct fire yet. They developed from a directed firecracker into reloadable paper-barrelled weapons. That's right, paper barrels. A surprisingly odd selection of materials to the modern mind. But we must remember that the Industrial Revolution and the Bessemer steel production technique has coloured our views of barrel materials, not the original Chinese. Now back to the early weapons. A quote from the history of the Jin, 1232, explains, and I quote, To make the lance, use Qi Huang paper, 16 layers of it for the barrel, and make it a bit longer than 60 centimetres. Stuff it with willow charcoal, iron fragments, magnet ends, sulphur, white arsenic, which is probably uh, an arrow and should have been saltpetre, and other ingredients and put a fuse in the end. Each troop has hanging on him a little iron pot to keep fire. And when it's time to do battle, the flames shoot out the front of the lance more than three metres. And when the gunpowder is depleted, the barrel isn't destroyed, from the history of the gin, end quote. They may well have been intact, the barrels, uh, but the number of shots to failure I am unable to locate, but I suspect it's not many. By 1276, barrels had transitioned to metal, usually bronze, and were covered 
uh, and were used independently of the lance. Basically a proto hand cannon or very small caliber gun. These fired a projectile wrapped in cloth as a seal. And the devices had a few incarnations in China, in particular as poison gas weapons. A poison fog magic smoke eruptor, as depicted in uh, Hulong Jing, is uh, located over on the website if you want to have a look at it there. Small shells emitting poisonous smoke are fired. As you can see from the world illustration over there, it looks very much like a barrel on a rudimentary fixed carriage. Uh, in 12, by 1280, fire lances had reached the Islamic world and were employed by European knights in 1396 and stayed in use until the storming of Bristol in 1643, of all things. More of a curiosity than a battlefield altering weapon. The Chinese continued to develop their pieces uh, during the Ming Dynasty from 1368 to 1644. They used crude pieces to some effect. Uh, surprisingly, though, they were used to the advantage of besieged cities, not to those on the attack. A quote from Andrade linked in the link in the show notes. Quote, in 1358, the siege of Shangjing, the Ming army attacked the city and the defenders used fire tubes to attack the enemy's advance guard. The siege was won by the defenders, whose fire tubes went off all at once, and the attacker's great army could not stand against them and had to withdraw, end quote. So massed fire rather than piecemeal discharges seems to have won the day in this siege. In 1388, artillery was used to good effect to defeat elements in the ming Mong mao War, and in further developments against the much despised foe, the westernmost Mongols, the Oirats, in 1414. Artillery caused such casualties and fear the Oirats withdrew from the field, abandoning their spare horses, even only to be caught in an ambush of previously concealed guns. So against cavalry, it uh, seems to have worked well. From 1370 or thereabouts, the Chinese moved from stone to iron projectiles and developed some early shells from around 1417. And it would appear that China's developments were on a par with or more advanced than the Islamic world in Europe at this stage. However, development stalled with most pieces no, weighing no more than 80 kilos. With the exception of three bombards, sort of early mortar, that had uh, twin trunnions and a 210 millimeter caliber. Uh, again, check the photo on the website if you're interested. That the Chinese artillery did not develop to the sizes found further west has been a bit of a puzzle, and there are three main explanations. Uh, one, the main enemies of the Ming were steppe nomad horse archers with few cities to besiege, and there was no need to build bigger and harder to transport pieces. That is, there was no military pressure to do so. Another explanation is the economic basis of Chinese and European societies, China being a highly centralised top-down society as opposed to the many warring states in competition with each other in Europe, and for that matter in the Islamic world. Uh, the latter led to technological development through competition as each state fought to keep its head above water. And the third explanation is that Chinese wall-building technology was far superior to that in the West. That being so, the pieces needed to batter the walls would have been prohibitively large, expensive and almost impossible to transport. This has some supporting evidence in that Chinese defensive walls were superior to anything in the West, even the Theodosian walls of Constantinople. My suspicion is that it's probably a combination of all these reasons and other things too that we don't know about. Stability of a regime was valued, change may have been looked upon suspiciously and the idea of just enough to get the job done might have been a thing too. Mobility over firepower may be another explanation but it really doesn't matter. What matters is the difference in developments between Chinese and European societies. That's a fairly basic overview of what happened early in China where the major propellant gunpowder was developed first Next week, we'll be looking at the development in uh, the Islamic world and how that fed across into Europe. Thanks for listening, and if you've got any corrections, let me know through the feedback form on the website. Link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>